Amen. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? It's good to see you. My name is Bubba. I'm one of the pastors. If you've not met before, welcome uh, to the gathering of God's people called Resurrection Church. Uh, today we're launching into a new sermon series called Marketplace Mission, and it's going to be a little mini series. We're going to spend three weeks really focused on uh, kind of your workplace and what does it mean to be someone who's very intentional in the workplace. And uh, over the next three weeks, we're going to focus on the method of work, uh, the meaning of work, and the mission of work. And we're going to go in a kind of a progression. We're actually going to start uh, today with the meaning of work. And then uh, next week, we'll be looking at the mission of we- work. And then the week after that, the method of work. And there's going to be a progression that we follow. So these weeks will build uh, from one to the other. Our hope is that uh, as we spend time in the scriptures, really kind of diving into this idea of work, God will transform you and that will inevitably lead to you being able to make an impact in your workplace. Uh, And that's kind of our hope and our prayer for this little mini series. What I'd like to do is I wanna pray for us and then we're gonna just jump into it, see what God would have for us Uh, today. You can go in your Bible and open up to Genesis chapter one. We're gonna be uh, spending some time in Genesis and mostly in Genesis, we'll bounce around to some other verses as well. But go to Genesis chapter one. Uh, Father God, we thank you for our time together Uh, in your word today, God. We want to hear from you. So we're asking and praying, Holy Spirit, speak to us, minister to us, open up our minds and our hearts to receive uh, your word and what you have for us. And we just take a moment to say, God, we're so thankful for you, that you're our God. Uh, Father, we're thankful that you're our good, loving Father, that you always take good care of us. Uh, Jesus, we're thankful that you are our Christ, our Messiah, the Son of God, who lived without sin, died for our sin, and rose from the grave, bringing salvation. Uh, We're thankful, Holy Spirit, that you are the spirit of truth who leads us into all truth. And we do pray and ask that even now, Holy Spirit, that you would speak truth to us and we would be able to receive that truth. God, we pray against the enemy's works and effects and uh, the lies of the enemy. And we ask, help us to be a people who are able to uh, not just believe the truth, but live in the truth, particularly as it relates to our work. And so today, God, we're praying that you would give us a biblical worldview of work, that you would help us understand what it means to be a people who are able to work unto the Lord. And so we pray this all in Jesus' good name. Amen. Well, you know, I was doing the math this morning. I was, you know, had the calculator out and I figured that if you started working when you're 16 years old and you work for roughly, you know, 50 years, so maybe you're like 66 or something, and you do an average of 40 hours a week, uh, you will over the course of your lifetime, if you do 50 years of work, roughly work about 100,000 hours. Isn't that crazy? To think about like a third of your life can be spent working, right? You sleep for a third of your life, you work for a third of your life, and then you get to enjoy a third of your life, <laughs> right? Uh, but, but seriously, we spend so much time working. Uh, it, it is a very important part of our lives. And my question to you is, uh, do, do you want to have meaning in your work, right? Do you want to have meaning and purpose in your work? Yes. Uh, I think we would all say like, yeah, of course, right? I don't want my, my work to be meaningless, but yet Oftentimes, I think we feel like our work is meaningless. Have you ever had a bad day or a rough day where you're just like, why am I doing what I'm doing? This just seems so pointless, so frivolous. Like, what's the point of it all? Uh, I'm sure you had one of those days. We, we each have those days from, from time to time. So how do we find meaning in our work? Well, what I wanna suggest to you today is that uh, you don't find meaning in your work, but rather you bring meaning to your work. That's what I want to suggest to you today. And, uh, and to help you understand what that actually means and how you can bring meaning to your work, we're just going to spend some time in the word of God, hearing from God, and let God shape our worldview so that we can have a biblical worldview when it comes to this topic of work. We're going to jump first into Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 26 through 28 to start with. Uh, this is what it says. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. 
and God blessed them and, uh, and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what we see in the book of Genesis is that out of nothing, God creates the universe, uh, the heavens, the earth, all living things on earth. And when it comes to creating humanity, God does something very, very special, right? Something special. Uh, Humanity is kind of set apart from the rest of creation. What is it that God does that's so special? If we look at verse 26, a little bit closer, it says, uh, God said, let us make man, mankind, in our image after our likeness. And so the thing that God does that is so special when it comes to creating humanity is he makes us in his image and likeness. In the image of God, that's how you are made. And when we think of image, oftentimes we think of image as like a a, a visible representation of something. And so it's like, well, what is this talking about? It's, it, when the Bible talks about image here, it's not talking about you or I being made to physically look like God, but rather what it's talking about is that we are made in such a way to where we are similar to God and we have the ability to be a physical representation of God on earth. So if you think about it, it's like, we're kind of like mirrors. A mirror is able to reflect an image and we have the ability to reflect aspects of God. We can reflect the heart of God, the character of God. There are some attributes that we share with God and we're able to reflect them as well. And so as God's representatives on earth, we have this very special and unique ability to image God, to reflect him. And with that comes a lot of dignity, value, and worth. Think about this for a moment, okay? I want you to consider this. The significance of being made in the image and likeness of God. You have dignity, value, and worth. You don't have to do something to earn dignity. Dignity is bestowed upon you. You don't have to somehow do something to prove your value or to somehow make others somehow think you're worthwhile. You are valuable, you are worthy, you are worthwhile, you have worth because you are an image bearer. It's who you are, right? It's who you are. God has made you set apart from all creation And he's bestowed his image upon you. And that is very, very special and very, very beautiful. And there's something that God has has done for us that is distinct from other living things on earth. Because we're his image bearers, he wants us to image him in a particular way. Look at the second part of verse 26. It says, uh, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So notice here that we as God's people, image bearers are given dominion. What is dominion? Dominion is about uh, oversight. Right? Governance, rule, that's dominion. And so God has given humanity dominion over the entire earth in everything on the earth. Here he he uses this language of like over the fish and the sea and over the birds and the heavens, over all the livestock, over everything that's creeping. This language that you and I, we have been bestowed upon us this God-given dominion to have oversight, rule, authority, delegated authority over everything on earth, which means we are stewards. Because what is a steward? A steward is someone who takes care of something on behalf of another. The steward is not the owner, the steward is the caretaker. 
Who's the owner? God's the owner, right? Because God is the creator who created the universe, the heavens, the earth, and all living things on earth because God created everything belongs to God. God is the owner of all. And yet God has made us in his image and likeness and bestowed upon us this incredible responsibility to be his representatives on earth with dominion over everything. So one of the ways in which we image God is by exercising our dominion through stewardship. Now, that begs an important question, which is, well, what does God want for our stewardship? Like, what does that look like practically? If we keep going here in Genesis, we look at verse 28, we see um, this. And God blessed them, and he said to them, Uh, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over, this kind of a phrase again, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. Now, what I want you to notice here is that in the creation account of humanity, God makes us in his image and likeness and then he bestows upon us dominion. And one of the first things God does is he blesses us. And, and, And the blessing that God gives us as image bearers is this blessing of dominion, this responsibility as stewards to take care of everything. And ultimately what God's goal for us is flourishing, right? That's what God wants. He wants you to flourish. He wants all of humanity to flourish. He wants us to steward in such a way to where everything on earth flourishes, everything. Right, that the fish would flourish and the birds would flourish and all the livestock would flourish, right? That, that cities and communities would flourish, that all the nations would flourish. Ultimately, that's what God wants. God wants everything, everything, everything to flourish. How does, how does our stewardship play out though practically? Now think about this, how does it play out? Well, it plays out through our work. Right? To, 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 to be fruitful and multiply, that takes work. Right? To fill the earth and subdue it, that's talking about like people moving and building cities and creating communities and nations and governments and things like that. That takes work uh, to have dominion, to like actually exercise leadership and authority over everything. That takes work. And so we're made in the image and likeness of God. We are given this high calling to be Uh, stewards and to have dominion and all of that is work. It's work. And so I want you to think of it this way. Whatever you do, right? Whatever you do, the work you do is part of your stewardship. And it is an outpouring of you exercising dominion as an image bearer. Here's the thing, friends. If you can connect these dots, I'm an image bearer, I have dominion, I'm to steward on behalf of God and stewardship is connected to whatever work I do. If you can connect those dots, you will start to understand that the work you do every day is not frivolous and pointless and meaningless, but rather the work you do is an outpouring and an expression of who you are as an image bearer. All right, so if you're a stay-at-home mom, uh, you are exercising dominion over your home and you are stewarding on God's behalf those, those little ones that you've been entrusted with. And if you're a policeman, you are uh, exercising dominion over the territory that you've been assigned. And as a steward, you are ensuring that the people that are in that area are safe and are able to flourish, right? And that's the work that you're doing. Right? If you're a business owner, you have uh, dominion over your business and you are to exercise your stewardship in such a way to where the people that you are you know, under your care, your employees or your, your customers, your vendors, the, the community that you impact, that they're able to flourish. Right? This plays out into any and every role that could potentially be had, right? So whatever work you do, you are exercising Stewardship, dominion, you are imaging God, okay? Now, 
I want you to see something that I think is pretty cool and very interesting. And, and you might not think it's cool and interesting at first, but I'm hoping that you'll, 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 you'll get there in just a moment. Look at Genesis chapter two, verse 15. It says, uh, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Now, the reason I said you might not think it's cool is because at first you're like, yeah, God like takes the man and he puts him in the garden and he's working it. What's the big deal? Think about this, okay? Think about this. In, in, the, in the book of Genesis, we see the creation account. And what we see is that God creates the universe, right? Heavens, the earth, all the planets, the stars, all of that. And it is good. And then God creates the earth and he shapes and forms the earth, the, the, the bodies of water, the, the masses of land, uh, and it's good. And then God creates and establishes all the living things on earth, you know, fish, birds, livestock, all of that, and it's good. And then God creates humanity. Adam and Eve, the first humans, are created, and it's good. Everything is good. And then what's the first thing that God does for Adam right after he's created? He gives him a job. And guess what? It is good. Right? That's what Genesis 2.15 is telling us. That's why it's so interesting is that we see like God's kind of original design for work. I'm going to create humanity. I'm going to create these people, put them in the garden. You got a job, right? And it's good. And this tells us something very, very important. Work itself is a part of God's blessing that he blesses upon humanity and he bestows upon humanity. So work is a good gift given by God, right? You got to get that. If you don't believe that, if you think work is not a good gift, then you, my friend, you don't have a biblical understanding of work. You don't see work the way that God sees work because work is a good gift that God gives as a blessing to you. Now, I get it. Right now, you're thinking, yeah, 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 but you don't know my work. I get it, right? And and you're probably even thinking like, well, if work is a blessing and work is good, then why is work so hard? You ever wondered why your work is so hard? It's it's an important question. It's a legitimate question. You know, why, why is work so hard? Well, we, we'll look at that in just a moment, but I, I want you to kind of understand. In the beginning, God creates the earth. It's good. Adam and Eve are with God in the garden, and it's all good. Adam has a job as a gardener. It's good. They have perfect fellowship with God. They have perfect fellowship with each other, and everything is flourishing. Everything is flourishing, right? But then, then something happens. We're told as we read through the account of Genesis that the devil comes and tempts Eve. He lies to her and he, and he, and he persuades her to reject God's word. And she believes the lies of the enemy And she rebels against God. What God had said, like, there's this one tree, I don't want you to eat of it. That that fruit is forbidden. And the devil says, no, no, it's not bad. It's not gonna hurt you. You should have some, it's all good. And she believes the lies and she takes some fruit. But the big thing that's happening there is she's actually rejecting God's word and she's rebelling against God. She then goes and gives some fruit to her husband and Adam does the same thing. He eats the fruit, he rejects God's word, he rebels against God. And here's what happens is in that act of rebellion, sin enters into the world and with it a curse that infects and affects negatively everything, everything, all creation, everything. And we see in Genesis chapter three, what God says to Adam as he's confronting Adam and Eve about what they've done. If we look at Genesis chapter three, verses 17 through 19, 
And to Adam, he, that is God, said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground, right? Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to the dust you shall return. Work is hard because of sin. That's why we look back, he says, the you know, ground is cursed because of you, right? The ground is cursed. Before the ground wasn't cursed, but now the ground is cursed. And the answer, like why is work so hard is very simple. Well, the work, work is hard because of sin. And I want you to see the difference that we see here in these verses of work before sin enters in the world and then after sin enters the world. And so I put together like a little uh, table for you, okay? Um, before sin entered the world, the ground wasn't cursed and it produced easily. After sin entered the world, the ground is cursed and it's difficult and painful to get the ground to produce. Before sin entered the world, work was filled with enjoyment and pleasure. After sin entered the world, work is filled with thorns and thistles. Before sin enters the world, work puts a smile on Adam's face. After sin enters the world, work puts sweat on Adam's face. We're told about the differences um, before and then after. How it becomes so painful and difficult. We're told about, you know, it's, the ground is cursed and there's thorns, there's thistles. It's painful. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. Before sin enters the world, work is good. After sin enters the world, guess what? Work is still good. And that's the part that you got to get. Work is still good. It's still a good gift, a blessing from God, yet it has been affected negatively by sin. This is important to understand because I think so often people believe a lie about work. And here's the lie. The lie is your work is a curse. Right, the devil comes in and says, your work is a curse. God doesn't love you. That's why your job's so bad. You're cursed and your work is a curse. It's not a curse. Rather, your work is cursed. And that distinction is very important. Your work is a blessing It's a blessing from God, but because work is cursed by sin, just like everything else, it's more difficult and more challenging than any of us would want it to be. You know, it, it seems to me that in our day, there is kind of this unspoken belief that Things that are hard are bad. Oh, it's so hard. It's so difficult. It must be bad. But if you really think about it, things that are hard and difficult and worthwhile are almost always good. Or I'll just say it this way. Things that are worthwhile are almost always hard and difficult because to create something good is hard and difficult. Here's what I mean. If you're gonna build a good marriage, it's gonna be hard and difficult and it's gonna require work, right? Married people said amen, right? If, if, 
you're going to develop a good relationship with your kids, it's going to be hard and difficult and require work, right? Parents, amen? If you're going to build a good business, it's gonna require a lot of effort, it's gonna be hard and take a lot of work, right? Business people, amen? Right? Anything you do that's worthwhile, right? You're gonna build a good legacy, it's gonna be hard and it's gonna require a lot of work. It's gonna be difficult, right? Good things often are very hard and very difficult and they require a lot of, of, of just endurance and perseverance, right? And so I wanna encourage you to lean into the hardness of it all because in the hardness and the difficulty is opportunity to grow, to mature, to learn to persevere, to learn how to depend on God. There's all kinds of opportunity for you to be shaped and formed to become more and more like Christ through the challenges and the difficulties of work. But don't think work is accursed. Understand work is cursed by sin, but work is a blessing. And it's a good thing that God has given me. Because if you understand that and you believe that and you know that, it will make a difference in how you go about your work. And, and I think it's important for you to understand how important work actually is. Right? Before the fall, right? Before the fall, God gives humanity work. Right? Sin and earnest the world, and now we're living in this time where we're 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 kind of like working and waiting for the return of Christ. But I want you to see how God's plan for work, in, it kind of has a, a, a long, long uh, part in our human experience. It's not temporary is what I'm trying to say. It, 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 here's what I mean, okay? Isaiah uh, Chapter 65, verses 17 through 19, I want you to see this. Behold, uh, this is kind of a prophetic picture of the future from Isaiah. For behold, I, I create the, the new heavens and the new earth, and the former things uh, shall not be remembered or come to mind. But, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness I will, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. Uh, no more shall, it be in, uh, shall be in it the sound of weeping and the cries of distress. So what this is, is Isaiah is kind of like speaking on God's behalf and, and God is proclaiming that in the future that he's gonna do something, that he's going to make all things new. This is a prophetic glimpse of the future that we also see echoed in Revelation chapter 21, where we're told that one day Jesus is gonna return and make all things new, right? Jesus dies for our sin. He rose from the grave. He ascends into heaven. He's reigning and ruling over all things right now. He promises, I will return. And when I return, Jesus says, I'm going to make a new heavens and a new earth. And the new city of God, the new Jerusalem is gonna descend from heaven to earth. And God is gonna dwell with his people face to face together forever on the new earth. No more sin, no more suffering. These verses here in Isaiah 50, uh, 65 are saying that same thing. They're echoing, they're kind of uh, prophesying this kind of future reality that's echoed in Revelation 21. And what I, what I want you to understand is, is this, this kind of view of eternity future and how it actually includes work. Because if you continue just a few verses later in verse 21, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree, that shall be the days of my people. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. He's still talking about this glimpse of the future. And we see here that in eternity future, there will be all kinds of work for us to do. Why? 
Because work is good and it's a blessing and it's a good gift that God gives us and work provides a blessing to everyone that is blessed by it. In fact, what does he say? Um, you'll build houses and you'll live in them. You're gonna plant you know, gardens and vineyards and you're gonna enjoy the, the fruit of them. And then the Lord is going to uh, rejoice in the work of your hands. This idea that in eternity future, we will still continue to work. And as we work, it will bless God and bless each other. And God will actually rejoice in our work. In eternity future. So think about this. Before sin enters the world, work. And work is good. Sin enters into the world, Work is still good, but work is cursed and affected by sin, which makes it hard. Jesus is going to return. He's going to make right all that's gone wrong. No more sin, no more suffering. New heavens, new earth, new resurrected glorified bodies, us with God forever in eternity future. And guess what? In eternity future, you work. I know, like right now, some of you are going... Oh man, I thought heaven on earth meant that I could retire and not work. And yet, what is God's plan for eternity future? You're going to keep working. But it will be different than it is now. It'll be what it's intended to be. It'll be filled with enjoyment and delight as it ought to be. Because it won't be cursed anymore nor will it be negatively infected and affected by sin. But understand, work is an important part of God's design and plan for humanity. You know, I think that we have kind of this idea in our culture, our American culture, that Uh, What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to work really, really hard for a certain amount of time. And you're supposed to make a certain amount of money that you can just stock up, right? Stock up, right? Just gonna pile up the money. And my goal is to work enough to make enough money so that I don't work anymore. And then I just live off, you know, it's like I build it all up and then I just keep living as it comes down and I'm hoping that I can just live off of it while I don't work for the rest of my life, right? Like that's what everyone's trying to do. The American dream. Make a lot of money, retire and have a lot of fun. And, and I, wanna, I, want you to, I wanna challenge that notion for a moment, okay? I know that some of you who are listening to me are retired and, um, and you're like, uh-oh, what's he gonna say? Uh, but, uh, or you're getting close to retiring. Here's, here's what I, I want you to consider for a moment. Um, our Americanized idea, our Americanized idea of retirement is not founded or grounded in biblical wisdom. It's not. And, and so what, what I think happens is people will spend their life doing work they don't really like. And they're like, I don't really enjoy this. So I wanna make enough money so I don't have to do this anymore. And what I wanna invite you to is to consider the idea of work separate from your job for a moment, right? If you, if you make good money and you're able to, you know, retire from your job, great. In fact, I hope every single one of you are able to one day retire from the work that you do that you don't enjoy. But don't retire to nothing, retire to something. Because the idea of work is a part of God's plan for us. I'm not saying that you have to you know, retire from your job and then go get another job doing something else and spend 40 hours a week. I'm not saying that. I'm saying exercising dominion as a steward is one of the ways that you image God. And so think of the idea of retirement as I retire from this type of stewardship in imaging God to another type of stewardship in imaging God. 
And if it just so happens that you were able to make enough money to where you don't need a salary, guess what? You get to do whatever you want and whatever work you want to the glory of God, right? So, so just think of it this way. We don't work hard so that we never work. We want to work faithfully and one day be free of the burdens of having to work so that we get to work and do the things we, we love and enjoy. And I would even say that if you can do the things you love and enjoy now, even better. All I'm trying to do, hear, hear me this, all I'm trying to do is simply say, let God's design for work inform how you plan to spend your golden years. Because here's the thing that most people don't realize. If you actually look at people who have accomplished amazing things in their life, almost all of the people who have done something really significant, they accomplish it later in life. In fact, they say that, you know, the 60s and 70s are when people do the most significant legacy building activities. And in our culture, there's almost this idea like, well, when you get to be 65, you retire. And at that point, you don't actually, you're not valuable anymore and you have nothing to contribute to society anymore. And so we're gonna just ship you off into retirement land. And that's not biblical because a biblical view would be the people who have lived longer should have more wisdom and more to contribute and offer. And so if you, if you look at it as I'm gonna retire, but that latter or last season of life that is in a season where I get to just focus on building legacy and that's the work that I'm doing. I'm just doing all kinds of really cool stuff, right? And, and that can be anything from praying for people, discipling people, planting gardens in your community. It could be uh, teaching and training and doing workshops. It could be like, there's all kinds of things. It could be as creative as you want it to be. There's a thousand things that you could do. The point I'm simply getting at is don't retire to nothing but to something and actually see that you can probably make a bigger impact in your 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even 90s than you would be able to make in your 20s and 30s. Because you've built a lot of relationships and hopefully a lot of trust and a lot of credibility because you've been living faithfully for decades, which means you can make a bigger impact. All I'm trying to do, friends, is simply say, let's let God define how we think of work and inform how we think of work. And in fact, God wants us to actually love our work. I don't know if you realize that. Let, let me show you something, okay? Let me show you something. In Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter uh, three, it says this. Um, so this is King Solomon. He's, a, he's, an, he's an older man. Um, and he, at this point in his life, um, he has uh, accomplished pretty much everything that can be accomplished. He's built tons of businesses. He's created the nation into this like economic power. And he's an old man reflecting on his life. Uh, and, and here's what he says. Uh, he says, uh, what gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. So basically here he's like, what's the point of work? Like what, what's, what's the, why do we have to work? He says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And then here's the part that I want you to really see. I perceive that there is nothing better for them uh, than to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil for this is God's gift to man. So what does he perceive later in life? A man who's done it all, has it all. He has more money than he could spend in a thousand lifetimes. He has more wisdom than anyone else on earth. What does he perceive? There's nothing better for you to do than to be joyful and to do good all the days of your life for you to eat and drink and take pleasure in your toil. Think about that. Toil, right? That hard, 
Hardness of work, it's hard, it's difficult, it's toil. He says, take pleasure in it. Why? This is God's gift to you. God has blessed you with work. Right? Do you actually believe that? He goes on a little bit later in the chapter in verse 22 to say, so I saw that there is nothing better than that, than that a man should rejoice in his work uh, for this is his lot. What's he saying? He's saying, God has blessed you with work. It's his gift to you. And if you can figure out how to enjoy it, you're experiencing the kind of work God wants for you. God wants you to enjoy the work you do, to take pleasure in it. Which means if you don't take pleasure in the work you currently do, either you need to change or possibly your work needs to change. Something needs to change. But understand this. God's heart for you is to actually do things you love. That's what he wants for you. He wants you to flourish. And as you take pleasure in your work and do things that you love, he wants you to help other people flourish. How do we enjoy what we do? Well, there's something else I want you to see. In Colossians uh, chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, he says, uh, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. What I want you to see here is a connection that he makes between your work and your worship. He's saying that your work and your worship are connected. That as you work, that is a part of your worship unto the Lord. Right? That, that whatever you do. So that's pretty inclusive, yes? Right? Whatever it is, doesn't matter what it is. Whatever it is. You know, whether it's like, uh, you know, taking out the trash or, you know, like, like selling a house or, uh, you know, helping someone in, your, in, in, in the office space, whatever it is, right? Like whatever type of work it is, doesn't matter what it is. It could be chores around the house. It could be part, part of your job, whatever it is. Do it heartily, like with vigor and passion, heartily. As for the Lord and not for men. Right? You do not work for your boss. You don't work for your boss. You don't work for your company. You don't work for your family. You don't even work for yourself. You work for the Lord. Because work is part of your worship. Oh man, if you can get that, that work is part of your worship, it will transform you and transform the way you work. Because you won't be doing it for a paycheck. Instead, it'll be an outpouring of you imaging God, exercising dominion as a steward, as God's representative. And that brings significant meaning into your work. Sometimes people think like, um, work brings meaning to my, to my life. Well, it, my work, that's what makes my life meaningful. And, and, and that is a distortion of identity because you are not what you do. You know, sometimes you'll meet someone, you'll be like, so tell me about yourself. Like, you know, who, who are you? Oh, I'm a doctor. You know, I'm a teacher. What are they doing? They're defining themselves, who they are based on what they do. And, and that's a distortion of identity, right? What, 
what you do does not define who you are. Rather, it's the opposite. Who you are defines how you do what you do. And so your work doesn't give you meaning, but rather you bring meaning into your work as an image bearer, a steward, exercising dominion. And, and what it also means is that there, there isn't a like um, sacred and secular divide. You know, sometimes people will be like, okay, well, you know, there's spiritual things, praying, reading your Bible, uh, attending church service, being a part of life group, spiritual things. And then there's like other things, work. And when, when someone has this divide of like, there's things that are sacred and there's things that are secular and work goes in the secular bucket, they do not have a biblical understanding of work. Biblically speaking, there's only a sacred sin divide. Something is sinful, therefore it's not sacred. And if it's not sinful, everything else is sacred because everything else can be done in faith to the glory of God. And what does he say here? Whatever you do, right? So whatever it is, whatever work it is, chores around the house, doing your nine to five throughout the week, Whatever it is, do unto the Lord. Because it is a part of your spiritual life. It is sacred. It's a part of your worship. I mean, imagine what can happen if Christians actually start to understand Work is an opportunity to image God to everyone we encounter through the platform of work. I mean, imagine this. Imagine hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of businesses all spread throughout our city and our region. And God just goes, and he's placing believers in all these different businesses schools, hospitals, right? Apartment complexes, uh, you know, office buildings, um, down at the military base. Uh, what do you have? All these representatives of Christ scattered all over the region, all called to exercise dominion in the place they work, to work unto the Lord, to bring forth the desires of God into that place, into those people. That is a powerful, powerful impact that's being made of the church to our communities through work. But a lot of times what happens is we don't see it that way. Instead, what we think is we go, well, I have like my spiritual life and then I gotta go do work. And there's a divide. And so we don't see ourselves as actually working unto the Lord. We think, well, I, I'll be unto the Lord the rest of the time, but here I've just gotta you know, do my duties. That's not what God says, right? God says, whatever you do, do unto the Lord. Here's, here's the heart of the matter, friend. Work for God, right? Work for God. If you work for God, you will find yourself enjoying your work more than you have ever enjoyed your work in your life. I, I assure you that, of this because... If you're working for a paycheck, the money will never be enough. And if you're working for yourself, whatever accolades or achievement you get, it won't be enough. And if you're working for some motivation other than God, it won't be enough. 
and you will continually find yourself dissatisfied and frustrated. But if you connect work to worship and you start working unto the Lord and you work for God, then you will start to find all kinds of connections between your faith and how God is working in you and through you in the work that you do. It will transform you and transform the work that you do. It will be other. It will be different. And so my invitation to you is this. Tomorrow, right? If you, if you do a, you know, a Monday through Friday type thing or whenever, whatever the next time you find yourself at whatever work it is you do, I want you to do this. I want you to practice this. Imagine that you are partnering with Jesus in your work. Imagine that right next to you is Jesus. Think of this as a spiritual discipline. Constantly be mindful that if you're in a board meeting or you're having some meeting with a, a vendor or whatever, you're, you're there and if there's, you know, where, wherever, just imagine there's a seat at the table and that's Jesus. And just keep telling yourself, I'm working unto the Lord. God gives me strength and by his strength I work. We're in this together. It's a partnership. And I assure you, if you do that, you will find yourself bringing so much meaning into all that you do. You'll show up early, you'll stay late, you'll help everybody else, and you will, you will bring the presence of God into that workplace and it will completely transform that community. That's what will happen. And you will receive a lot of joy in the process. You see, because ultimately, what do we do? As we image God, we're modeling God. God works. We work because God works. And there's a lot of good work we can do, but there's one, one work we can never do, and that is the work of salvation. And I want you to consider this for a moment. Consider all the work that God has done and is doing on your behalf. God takes on humanity. He puts on flesh. He leaves heaven and comes to earth becoming the God-man, Jesus, that took work. While on earth, Jesus is working to preach the gospel, to cast out demons, to heal people, to do miracles, right? He works diligently. Though he's innocent, he's arrested and betrayed, and he's condemned to die, which then he's gotta have some of the most difficult work where he goes to the cross to suffer and die on your behalf for your sin. He dies, his body is placed in the tomb, but the work is not done. On the third day, he defeats death. That's some work. But even after resurrecting from the grave, the work is not done. He appears to many people. He rallies the disciples and he launches the church. And then he ascends into the heavens. And the work is still not done because he's reigning and ruling over all things, sustaining the universe as we know it right now, preparing a place for us and the work is still not done because he will return to establish that new heavens, new earth. And for all eternity future, God will continue to work on our behalf. When you understand the work God does for you, it gladly makes you want to do work for him. Right? He does a work you can't do, salvation, so that you can be transformed and live unto him and to be able to be his presence on earth in a beautiful way of showing the heart and character of Christ to the people you work with. So work with intentionality and passion and work with meaning. Let's pray. God, we thank you for uh, just your word, how you help us understand life and how you help us understand aspects of life such as work. And Lord, I am praying and, and asking that even now as we're contemplating these things that we've looked at today and we've heard from you, may you even now start to create in us a heart that says, yes, 
Lord, I want to work unto you. I want to serve you through whatever work I do. God, help us to be a people who, who, who do not compartmentalize our lives, but rather we live integrated that 24-7 we are a people of faith and 24-7 we are living unto the Lord. And so God, help us to be a people who in everything, whatever work it is, whether it's doing the dishes or mowing the lawn or you know, you know, meeting obligations uh, of, our, uh, of our job responsibilities, Lord, whatever it is, May we see that work as an opportunity for worship. May we worship you and love you and serve you. And may we also delight in the work that you've given us to do, knowing that in the work itself, we get to image you. And that's a beautiful thing. I do pray and ask God that you would mobilize us as a church to be your presence spread across the region and that Together, we would be able to impact hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workplaces. That we would be able to to show the heart of Jesus and show the love of Jesus in each of those communities. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen.